Uh, I should say just a few words about our speaker, Mr. Nelson. And there are so many things to say that started reeling off the you start reeling off the list. This man is a MacArthur genius fellow. You could stop there. He's won a lifetime Emmy. And he's in the prime of his career. He's already won a lifetime achievement Emmy. He's won a lifetime achievement Peabody. He's received the National Humanities Medal from in 2013 from President Obama. He's won five Emmys overall. He's he, his Freedom Riders film, documentary film, won three Emmys itself. He's won two Sundance Awards. Uh, he's created a lab. He was talking about over lunch that uh, we hope we have time to talk about. That's really so productive and drawing out new voices and new directors for documentary films. So I could keep going, but let me just introduce Mr. Stanley Nelson Jr. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all to say that I'm old and been around a long time. <laughs> But it's good. Um, I'm going to show. We're going to show a, a clip from uh, the latest film that, that we made, "Tell Them We Are Rising: The Story of Historically Black Colleges and Universities," that we just finished in January. Um, and we showed the we've shown the film three times: once at Sundance, an, another at a documentary program at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and uh, on Wednesday night we showed it here at the Nickelodeon Theater. So um, we have not shown this film very much at all. Um, the film will air on PBS in February, um, so we've got a, a year, and, and we're going to really start doing the publicity and stuff for the film uh, next uh, in the fall. Going on, but I should say the couple of festivals that we are in, and if anybody knows anybody uh, in Green, we're in Greensboro and Winston Salem on Monday and Tuesday of next week, and then on Saturday of a week from tomorrow, we're at the Full Frame Film Festival in Durham. So if anybody knows anybody there, we're we're, we're in those places with the film, um, but we're really trying to scale back some of the, the and we're also going to be at, at Fisk in Nashville for a fundraiser on, I think it's the 27th of April. Um, so we're trying to scale stuff back until the fall, but you know, when people ask us to do stuff, we're, we're, we're trying to do it as much as possible. Um, I, we're we're going to show a little clip of the film, and then afterwards, uh, Chris and I will uh, kind of be in discussion about uh, the film and research and, and all of those good things in this film and other films. Um, if we have time, we can show some clips from, from a couple of other productions, but we may not have time to do that. Um, so, who was there last night for the for a little bit of screening? Okay, so for everybody who was there, who wasn't there, uh, Tell Them We're Rising is the, is the story of historically black colleges and universities. It starts out um, in, in during slavery, where, black, where it was illegal for black people to learn to read and write, and, and then goes through different stories, uh, eight or so different stories that we tell up to the present. Um, we're gonna look at a clip that the clip right before this talks about the sit-in movements uh, in 1961 that started in Greensboro. But um, it looks at it, hopefully in a different way, it looks at it as a kind of a student movement and, and, and a rebellion of, of students. And this, and, and after um, basically the students win all over the South and, and, and uh, stores and lunch counters are, are desegregated, um, we move into this next chapter in the film. Uh, so we're gonna watch this, this next chapter um, and then uh, this this runs uh, maybe 12 minutes or so, and then we'll talk for a little while. Uh, any questions so far? All right, so we're gonna we're gonna roll and, and take a look. Yeah. <laughs> Black college campus in the 1960s is getting more and more complex. They've been already trying to change the world outside, changing a society that was about separation of the races. You get to the late 60s and early 70s, 
that energy for change starts to turn inward. When a black person looks at himself in the context of America, that's what he has to decide, who am I? And when he finds out who he is, then he knows what he has to do. A lot of the conflict that's starting to happen is between the students and the administrators. Students and the boards of trustees. They're wanting to see themselves far more than they have in the past. And so that makes for some pretty hot times on black college campuses. The present administration are the children of last generation. We're the men and the women of this generation and the generations to come. Either they'll come with us or be left behind. Most likely they'll be left behind. Well, about 1,000 students here at Howard University have sat in and held control of this administration building. There are no classes. The entire educational system is shut down. Many of us will stay in the administration building and be arrested. There will be boycotts until there is progress, and we are prepared to boycott until infinity. It appears to me uh, that the attitudes on the part of the students suggest that an explosion among them is imminent. The question here before us is like, who gonna control our education? Whether we gonna let white folks control it or black people? And the students at Boise College are taking a position that black people gonna control our education. You also start to see the police being more vile in their approach to interacting with students. President Nixon has urged college officials to be firm in dealing with campus disorder. And that's what Dr. Potts was doing when he agreed to the use of the National Guard. Black colleges were particularly vulnerable to police invasion because white politicians were quick to call on the police and quick to look the other way when police used deadly force. When the bullets were hitting the walls, I was on the floor and there were a lot of people on top of me. And I don't know what was happening. All I know, I could just hit a pound against the windows and glass popping everywhere. This kind of atmosphere of policing and of crackdown made students very, very vulnerable. Platform shoes were style too. Platform shoes and bell bottoms. I hurt my feet. I had a head full of it. It was wearing afros. We all knew what we were dressed. We all had the little small fingers so it looks good for us. My sister and my brother had already guessed a southern university, so I knew I should be next. We wanted to go to Southern, the black college. We had a Southern campus. There was like 10,000 students on campus. And there were people from Seattle, New York, Chicago, Houston, Texas, all these places. It was amazing. The mix of people was one of the elements that defined Southern. It was an intellectual and scholarly oasis that I really, really wanted to be a part of, and all of it was there. Southern University in Louisiana was the largest public black college in the United States. There was a black president and black administrators, but it was under the control of the white elected officials in Louisiana, who only spent half as much per pupil as they did on the predominantly white LSU. One third or fourth week, and you can see that something else was happening on campus. You get another vibe that there were some students that weren't happy with what was going on. They want to teach everything, white man. We're trying to break away from this thing. See, too long we've been listening to white people in their ways. We're developing our own ideas. We want adequate facilities, be able to put them into action. We didn't feel that we had enough professors, adequate classroom space, better funded. More input into the curriculum. And it started to build, and it started to build. And so we decided that the, the best thing to do was a very direct thing, and take this, these matters directly to President Netanyahu. 
We met with him, and we thought that his response was not a positive one. And so we decided to block our classes. We will not go back to class no matter how the man goes back. Students at Southern University's campuses in Baton Rouge and New Orleans began a series of marches and demonstrations demanding the resignation of the school's president and control over the administration. For an entire month, we boycotted classes, and that never been done. Southern uh, had a major football tradition. We knew that we could have some impact if we drew the attention of people who attended these games. There were demonstrators who went onto the football field and stopped the football game. That's when I was impressed. I said, this is really big. Maybe the administration will listen to them. That something great is gonna happen here. When they take the attitude that they will walk out classes unless they get their way completely and in step, then it just becomes necessary to let it be known that that just cannot happen. Call would go and stand on campus stand around all day in uniform and, and a show of force on the parking lot and ride through the campus. We started training the students around to see where they were going or where they were holding meetings off campus. Everybody was on standby in a, in a high alert situation. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Well, of course, I was not going to sit by and allow yeah. them or anybody to destroy public property. They belong to the students and belong to the people of the state. And while I sympathized with their complaints and was willing to address them, I was not going to allow them to destroy the university or its buildings. The student movement was indeed a nonviolent movement. There was not one incident during that entire period of time uh, that represented any violence, certainly any violence on the, on the part of students. Somewhere between two and o'clock in the morning, I received a knock on my door, which turned out to be the police, and they handed me a warrant for my arrest. I was scared. I'd never been in jail before. I didn't know what to expect. On the morning of November 16th, there was no police around. It was a very serene day, campus. We did what we were doing every day, and that is we were grabbing students who needed the class. Just that this day we informed them that these four students had been arrested and that we were going to go over to President Edgar's office and ask him to go downtown and get the students out of jail. He let us in his office and he said, yes, he will do that. And he said, you can stay here until I return. So we took him at his word. He left the building. The call that the sheriff's office received, and who made the call from Southern University, I don't know. But it informed us that Dr. Nettle was being held hostage he was in the administration building that had been taken over by a student. And we was ordered to free the hostage. But we heard this noise outside and looked out the window. About 300 sheriff's office deputies and state police troopers assembled on campus to carry out Governor Edwards' demand that order be maintained. We needed knew that Nettleville had betrayed us. M16s, shotguns, sidearms, you name it, they had. To our amazement, there was a tank with them. So Big Bertha, they call it, it was a big blue armored personnel carrier built out of steel. It was there in front of the administration building park. This thing's frightening. We were about to go to war. We had every, every deputy that could have a uniform on. Some of them was new, some of them was reserved, a lot of them wasn't trained. Nobody knew what was going to happen. And the state police was looking right at him. They ain't done. They rolled up tear gas cans toward the crowd. There was a body troop. There was a state police, state troop. Have some rolling up looking right at him. One of the students leaned down and picked it up. Turned the back of the deck. That's when he got broken. Chaos it was, it was something that was quite surreal. Big work had some portholes on the side of it, and shots were coming out of there 
rapidly. You can see this rocket from the vibration from the shot to the There were two people left on the ground. I thought that they had been knocked down by the rush of students trying to get away. But then I remember this girl turned around and started screaming. Coming out of the administration building, what I noticed, what I'm sure a lot of other people noticed, was a pool of blood with what looked like brain matter floating around in it. We came out by that time, the bodies was gone, but we saw the uh, markers and the blood everywhere. And we were weaving and crying and going back to the dome. And they say, you know that was your brother, huh? I say, what? I went numb. There has been trouble at Southern University between black students and authorities for a couple of weeks, and today it ended in death. And on the TV show up, they called this thing. 20-year-old Denver Smith. Denver Smith and Leonard Brown. He was never a part of the movement at all. If I hadn't been involved, my brother never would have been there. The accident would not have happened at all if they had not taken upon themselves to occupy the president's office. That is the triggering mechanism. Had they just gone about peacefully demonstrating and agitating and doing what they wanted to do and had a right to do, it never would have happened. It came as a surprise to me after we found out later that afternoon that Dr. Medical was not on campus during the whole uh, period of time we were there at the administration building with the students, that he was not on campus at all. I relived that moment because I was one of the leaders who led the students to Nedley's office who believed that he would go down and get these students out of jail and they trusted me. Though I didn't pull the trigger. As a leader, I may have been, been responsible. They were exercising their constitutional rights and they get killed for it. They die for it. Nobody said this y'all was The one of the things we are always looking for uh, is the new evidence, the new archives to tell a story in a more complete, complex way or from a different perspective. So can you tell us about this particular piece and how you uncovered that? Um, 
first, let me say uh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I apologize if I repeat anything that I've said last night. I've done, I've had been doing a lot of these things the last couple of days. I can't remember what I said where and what I did truthfully. So um, please excuse me if I repeat myself. But um, I think that uh, one of the reasons why we actually chose Southern was because we were able to find this footage, and that was just a, a, a you know, you know, digging and digging and digging. And sometimes um, it, it's that you know somebody says, "I think I saw footage of this," um, or there is footage, but I don't know where it came from. But once we know that there's footage, then it, it really helps us because then we can press and we just press. Um, originally, the way that we had um, conceived this section was it was about campus. Uh, violence uh, kind of across the board and we, we actually cut the section uh, with the story of Ar the Orangeburg massacre as part of it but as we got into it we, this this section was just so powerful and, and and partially that was because we had the physical evidence because we had this incredible footage uh, of, of these two guys actually getting shot um, that that we um, you know, after a long struggle, um, we said, you know, let's just try it without Orangeburg, and it just seemed to work better uh, as a segment. But again, that part of the reason why we're there, part of the reason why we went to Southern was because there was physical evidence there that we could use, and, and that means a really, you know, great deal to, to, to us as filmmakers. I mean, we can't, we can't make a film unless we have something to show. So who had that footage? Where did you know? I, I I can't really remember. It was it was it was done by by the TV station there because the uh, um, it, it had been it had, you know it was a big deal. The, the the campus protests were a big deal by the time the kids got shot, so the cameras were there. And I, I I'm sorry, I just forget it. It was it was it was no longer with the station. They had given the footage or sold the footage to somebody else who then we had to dig the footage out from. But again, we probably wouldn't have done that much digging if somebody hadn't said that there is footage, that, that, that there is footage of this, and that, that then that drives us forward. Um, one of the uh, story, um, uh, another example of that is when we did Freedom Riders, um, someone, you know, there's this great, great quote um, uh, where Bobby Kennedy uh, says, um, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, my my father was discriminated against too because he's a Catholic, and, and and I think I want to do away with all discrimination. I think we will one day. And one day we might even have a Negro president. And it's a, it's a, just a great great quote, you know, in, in, um, given you know, Obama. And uh, we we searched hard, high and low for that because someone else told us that that quote existed. Um, and we we actually searched for that, that for like six months before we found it, you know, uh, somewhere. <laughs> But, but it's just a matter of, of looking. It helps when you kind of when, when you know that that something exists, then you can really center on finding it. Had so many examples of that new new archives, new evidence in your in your films. And you're mentioning Freedom Riders. Can you tell a story about the uh, the photographic archives and negatives from Jeff and Ebony? Story of how you got those and the process. Yeah, I mean that that was really more um, in, in the murder of Emmett Till that 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 we really had a hard time um, because because uh, Jet and and, and 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 for Freedom Rights also yeah yeah um, you know Jet um, publishes the, the photos uh, of, of Emmett Till uh, every year they, they have, every year since Emmett Till's death it's been kind of this hallmark of what Jet does and uh, in, in, in Freedom Ride and uh, murder of Emmett Till was the first time that in Freedom Riders was really the it was really the first time that we worked with Ebony and Johnson Publications, um, and that we worked with them directly, who published uh, Ebony and Jet, we worked with Johnson Publications. Because before, Johnson Publications never sold their stills. That was their, we don't, we don't sell them, we're not gonna talk to you, we don't sell them. But by the time we got the Freedom Riders, they did, and they, they because everybody realizes now that stills are an asset, you can make money on, se on, on selling these stills. You know, the stills might go for, um, you know, fifty dollars or three hundred dollars a piece, um, and you know, in this in this film, they're probably using you know, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of photos. Um, so so, Jet and Ebony said, okay, we'll, we'll sell you some photos, 
And we and the problem, and we ran into this really even more with this film on HBCUs, is that a lot of times they're not these organizations aren't used to working with filmmakers. They're not used to working with filmmakers, especially you know filmmakers from New York. You know, who talk fast. And, you know, want, want everything fast, and and you know they and when we worked with Ebony and Jack, you know they kept sending us the photos, and they just didn't look right, and they didn't look right, and they didn't look right, and and we actually had four graphic designers working on Freedom Riders too, and on this film also, but we had four on Freedom Riders the first time to clean up the photos, and and we couldn't get a photo that looked right, so we have to get the photos at 600 DPI and blah blah blah, and they don't even know what that is. We have to explain it, you know, like that. We have to explain that you can't go to Kinkos and just copy it. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and and with Jet and everything, we're like, well, could you just send us the photos? Just send them to us. We'll, we'll we'll deal with it and send them back. And they're like, no, we can't do that. And then finally, one of the uh, graphic designers said. Um, I think the problem is that their scanner is crappy, and their scanner is dirty, and it's no good, and they have a cheap scanner. <laughs> and that turned out that that was the problem. Oh, yeah. so we, I asked them if we bought them a new scanner, or if we told them that, and they bought a new scanner, but that was the problem. It took months to solve this thing, because they just couldn't get us a decent copy that we could use. Um, and, and so, you know, it, that, that was a huge problem. And, and we ran into that even more with this film on, on, on HBCUs. One of the reasons why I actually made this film was because of, we knew that these schools had these incredible archives um, and that had never been used. You know, one of the things that when you're making films is you're always looking for new new shots, new new, new, new photos, new footage. And the majority, the vast majority of my films, you know, are about the African American community. And, and the photos of African Americans have been mine. We've all seen them all, you know, a lot of them, um, because you know, black people for the for the most part didn't have cameras, you know, and didn't take photos. And when black people took photos, they went into the, the a photographic studio, you know, in a lot of towns um, here, uh, a lot of towns there there was a black uh, photographer, a black uh, photographic studio, and black people went there to get their picture taken. But you know, how do you get your picture taken in a photographic studio, right? You put on your best clothes. <laughs> you know, and so there's lots of photos like that. And there's very few photos of black people, you know, candid photos of black people in the twenties, you know, you know, just doing doing whatever. Um, so we're always looking for for, for new photos, for, for different different archives, different footage. Um, and it came to me somehow, maybe doing another film, that in the black black colleges and universities, there were all these stills that they had. Okay. You know, um, most of the most, a lot of the schools started in 1865 and on. Right after the Civil War, they took pictures. They had yearbooks. They have all these pictures, and nobody, nobody was using those pictures. Nobody was going to, you know, uh, uh, Fisk or Allen or or, or, or you know uh, North Carolina a t or or, or or Howard, and and saying, you know, what do you have in your archives? And so that's that was one of our major focuses. Uh, in this film was going to those archives. So the film starts back in 1840 and and, and, um, and, and goes through. And, and those early photos um, are just incredible. I mean, they're just incredible. Um, one of the dirt, little dirty secrets that, that a lot of people don't know is is uh, old photos look really good. They actually look better than photos now because now people are taking photos with their phones that are crappy. Back then, they had eight by ten negatives. So the negative, you know, so the, the quality of a photo vastly depends on, on the size of the negative, right? If your negative is this big, it has just more whatever pixels that we call it now, you know, in, in it than if you have a little tiny ne negative like that. So they were taking these huge negative pictures. So those pictures are, are beautiful. You see in, in, in this little section where they're saying lift every voice, those old pictures, they're just incredible. Um, so we then had that, we then, we started out, we, we first started out, we were going to try to go to every single college. There's 105 black schools. We were trying to, we were going to go to every single one and do it, every single archives. And after like two weeks, uh, we had two researchers, they were like, Stanley, it's, it's not going to happen. It takes a week to get somebody on the phone, you know, um, because a lot of the schools, I mean, they don't have anybody who, who they don't have an archivist. 
you know, they're lucky if you know, they might have one librarian who, you know, if, if you get her on the phone or him on the phone, they're like, well, you know, maybe two weeks from Tuesday, I can go look in the boxes in the back, you know, and, and see what we've got. So we had to kind of narrow our search and try to figure out which of the schools were kind of organized and work with those schools. But it was still, it was, you know, I, the vast majority of those schools had never been asked by a film company to, to, to get really good pictures and really good prints and, and to you know, get them up online at 600 DPI and all that kind of stuff. They had never, they, and so a lot of it was kind of um, you know, uh, inventing the wheel with, with every school. For Freedom Riders, you uh, uncovered the FBI footage. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that you know, um, we really, I, I, you know, I've done a number of historical films, and I, and I really look at, you know, the photos and the, and the footage as being, you know, another character in the film, and it's really what makes the films, you know, and I've been very, very fortunate um, to do a, a bunch of films with American Experience on PBS, you know, who, who gave me the time and the resources to, like, try to do it right. That's what they want to try to do. And the last couple of films, this film and, and uh, the Black Panthers, Vanguard Revolution, we did independently, but we also had the resources to kind of do it right. Um, and that's like, you know, looking for, for every single photo and a piece of footage and, and, and individual and, and a witness that we possibly can find and following every lead that we can find. So when we were doing um, Freedom Riders, they uh, firebombed a bus outside of uh, Anniston, Alabama. And um, the FBI actually held hearings, which was about as far as the FBI ever went. Um, it was really surprising that they held hearings. But they held hearings, the FBI held hearings into the firebombing back then. And so we got the transcript of the, fi uh, uh, of the FBI hearings, and they said, um, you know, we talk, I forget the guy's name, like Dave Douglas. We, we you know, we, you know, uh, is an interview with Dave Douglas uh, about the firebombings. And this guy, Dave Douglas, said, you know, um, is all in the transcript. I, you know, I, I lived, uh, you know, a quarter mile down the road, and we saw the incident happening. My son ran out with his Super 8 camera that he had gotten for Christmas, and started f and filmed the bus burning. And that's kind of all it said. And oh, oh, and and, and it said um, he said I don't have the film anymore because the FBI confiscated it. Confiscated the film. So we went to the FBI and said, you know, so you confiscated this guy's film. Now, we're talking 50 years ago, literally 48 years ago. And we said, so you confiscated the guy's film. Where is it? You, do you have it? And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know anything about the film. So we Xeroxed the page and sent them the page from the transcript that said they had taken the film. And they said, OK, we'll get right back to you. <laughs> and six months later, we get this call. They say, OK, we found the film. Do you want it? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, send it to us. <laughs> and so and it was actually this super great film that this kid had taken of the bus burning and smoke coming out of the bus and the bus being towed away, all burnt out and stuff like that. And it was just a matter of trying, you know, like, you know, like, you, know like, you feel like private detectives, you know, we all like detective movies, you know, so to, to try to track it down and actually find, find this footage. And I'm convinced that, that the reason why the FBI did this and found it was because you know, the FBI has a lot of pride in being the FBI, you know. And so, how does the FBI look if they confiscated this film and then they can't find it? You know, like what does that say about the FBI? So it meant something to them. Yes, we confiscated it, but we cataloged it as you know, A seventy four thirty seven twenty one A. Here it is, you know. And so they actually found it. We actually used it, and, and uh, great thing was free too. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's great. Uh, along a little bit different uh, track, but the same idea of that pursuit, uh, interviews. Can you tell us about some challenging interviews that were really useful and hard to get, but really useful in the storytelling? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, interviews are, are, are the same way. You know, um, when we did Freedom Riders, I think we had, Freedom Riders has just an amazing interview. With the governor, uh, who was, was the governor of Alabama back then, was name? What's his name? Patterson. Patterson, Governor Patterson, who was the governor of Alabama. 
uh, back then in '61. In, in, uh, he was, and the, the great thing for us, he was the youngest governor ever of Alabama. He was 32 when he became governor, so we interviewed him you know, 50 years later almost. And so he was like 79 or almost 80 when we interviewed him, but he was still, you know, really, uh, 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 you know, his brain was fine. And, and, and um, you know, we, we, I, we had a producer that I worked with a lot on that one, and she's just great at convincing people to, uh, to be interviewed, you know, she like just she talk. She'll, I mean, sometimes we just listen to her on the phone, like you know, laugh because she's like hilarious, you know. She just talks forever, you know, and, and she's she's sincere. I mean, she's not like she's joking, but she's like, "Hi, Dr. Patterson, how are you? You still have that stomach ache? Oh, good, you know. Did you try to have the Good, good. And, and how's the dog? How's Rex? Yeah, good." Yeah, 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 my dog too, yeah, yeah, this was like, I mean, this was over hours, you know, oh my God, but she's great, you know, and, and, but that's just her personality, you know, it's not BS, she's just like, like that, and, uh, you know, and she talked to him and she said, yeah, he wants to talk, you know, and he went down there and uh, interviewed him, it was, the, it was just the weirdest, weirdest interview, I mean, Governor Patterson was the one, you know, who, he might have been the one who said Martin Luther Coon, I might have been Governor Patterson. Uh, he, you know, he was just like, you know, he's talking about neighbors, and you know, and his thing was like, you know, if they, you know, he said, you know, if they, if they stay out of the state, I'll protect them. If they come in the state, I can't protect them. I, that's not, you know, I can't do that. They're coming here making trouble. They get what they deserve. That was his attitude. Um, you know, and, and so we went down there to interview him, and uh, you know, the crew was largely African American. Um, and we went to his house to interview him, and it was the weirdest thing because Obama had just gotten elected for the first time, and Patterson's a Democrat, you know, so he was like happy, you know, <laughs> in a lot of ways, you know, you know, I think in his being a Democrat took over from any kind of racism they had, you know, we're back in we're back in business, um, but also Patterson was this guy whose his father had been, I think, Attorney General. Um, you know, so you know, he wasn't. He, he was not. He was an educated guy. I mean, and he knew better. You know, um, he's the guy. You know, he beat uh, George Wallace in the election of '58, and he said, and that's what George Wallace supposedly said, "I'll never be out nigger again." You know, I was out nigger, and 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 I think Patterson wanted to kind of have a chance to to just. It's not redemption. What's the word for it? He just wanted a chance to get stuff off his chest and talk, you know, because he knew he was wrong. I mean, he wasn't, you know, I mean, but but at, at that point, I think in the South, you know, the politicians had to play to the lowest common denominator. You know, that's who they played to, and, and he, that's what he played to. And, he, and I think he was, he was really sorry. He said, actually, we didn't use this in the film, but he said, you know, look, I did I did a lot of this stuff because I wanted to get reelected. And, uh, you know, I thought it would help me get reelected. And I should have gone with my heart because I, I lost to George Wallace the second time anyway, and I didn't get elected. So I should have gone with what I really felt. We actually did a uh, a little side thing on the web where we actually used that. But we didn't want to use it in the film. We didn't want to flash forward in the film to you know what he thinks about uh, you know what could have happened or uh, what happened after the story of the Freedom Riders. But I think that you know, it, was, it was that piece of him. One of the other things that you are obviously tremendously skilled at in your documentaries and that anybody who works with history struggles with is shaping the narrative, how to be true to the evidence and yet which story to tell, where to cut it off. So how do you manage that? What are your... You know, I think that the, what I'm always trying to do, I'm always thinking about you guys here in this room as historians, you know, like saying, you know, Standing. <laughs> <laughs> That's you were lying there. You know, so and so we're trying to be true to history as much as we possibly can, you know, and not and not lie about history and not take shortcuts. I mean, you know, um but 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 to have a clear a clear straight narrative. So to give you an idea, you know, in Freedom Riders, which is the story, you know, they, they kinda of get on the bus in DC and they go down south and, and they, you know, um, have various trials and tribulations, to say the least, as they go through the South. Well, one of the first 
the first incident is, is in Rock Hill, Rock Hill, in South Carolina. Yeah. That's the first incident they had. Mm -hmm. And and actually, when we started doing Freedom Riders, we couldn't figure. I you know, we were assigned. The, American Jews asked us if we wanted to do it. You know. And I said, you know, yeah, we really do, yeah. And I didn't know there's three freedom riders or the one freedom riders, you know. I don't think I know. Like, but, but as we got into it, it was like, oh, this was a great story. But we couldn't figure out the story. You know, we couldn't mm -hmm. figure out, like, wait, okay, so they go to Addison first or they go to Birmingham first. And then they get beat here and then they get, this happens here. And, they get, and so we had to have a chart to tell us where they, where they went. And the first confrontation that happens is is in Rock Hill, and that's um, and uh, that's where John Lewis has a confrontation with this guy. And basically, they get off the bus to go to the bathroom or something, get some coffee or something, and they basically run out of town. They get you know, run out of town. We spent a lot of time with that, and, we, and, and finally, we cut that from the story because they then go to. You know, the the, the, the the big confrontation is in Aniston, you know, the, the next one where they where they set the bus on fire. And then the other bus is a free, there's a trailways bus and a Greyhound bus, and the trailways bus goes on to Birmingham where they get beat up so bad they have, uh, they're, they're hospitalized. And the Rock Hill event, you know, we struggled with because it was the first thing that happened, but it just seemed like it, just was kind of took away from everything else and was too much. It was just too much information. You know, I mean, and that's the struggle that you have as a filmmaker. Is you, you, it's not like you're writing a book. You know, when you're writing a book, you know, I guess, I've never written a book, but if you guys have, you know, you call your publisher and say, you know, I'll make it 50 pages longer. And they're like, yeah, okay, fine, you know, <laughs> whatever. You know, or I, I need another 10 pages. You know, we, we can, we don't have that. We can't say, I want to make this thing 20 minutes longer. You know, you can't, and and it also changes the way the audience sees the film. It just becomes like cumbersome, too much information um, sometimes. So we try to streamline. Them. You have to streamline the story. You know, you can't. You can't. I mean, the we, the Freedom Riders was based on uh, Ray Arsenal's book, which is like literally that thick. It's a doorstop, you know. Um, and so you have to streamline. Line it, but you don't want to streamline, streamline it and, 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 and change history. So a lot of times for us, it's like, okay, what ha what what was the conclusion of that? Like what, you see what I mean? So in Rock Hill, yeah, they got chased out of town, but they got back on the bus and they kept going. So like what was the conclusion? Nothing in some ways, you know? So it was something that we felt we could cut. But believe me, it wasn't like, oh, cut it. We, we, I think we, we talked to John about, the, you know, we interviewed people about it, we cut the story, we put it in the film, and then sometimes it's just like, okay, you know, it just works better without it. And, and Rock Hill might have been, sometimes it's the editors, you know, and they'll come in and just say, you know, uh, I think we should cut Rock Hill. And I'm like, what? You can't cut that? And they're like, well, I cut it. And now look, look at the film without it. And then you look at the film, and it's clearly just makes more sense, more narrative sense to go without it. And then the question is, is that really how we change our history? And if we don't feel we are, then we go with it. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's, a nice, it's great to get insight into the process and how you work. We've got time for a few questions from the uh, gathering. Please. Yeah, so I have two, two really quick questions. The first one is, when you did Southern, did you actually look at, or did you, were you able to find um, the footage of Southern's march on well, Baton Rouge? I think it was 1950s, 1953. We didn't look for it. Okay, well, it was, it's, it's in the Secretary of State. And it's interesting, for its age, I mean, mm -hmm. from the 1950s, it's very grainy, very difficult. It's all been digitized. But and poorly digitized it appears to be. But it's interesting footage of watching of where the um, actual camera people walked amid the uh -huh. um, actual marchers and focused around and cutting and picking them up as they marched. The second really quick question is about Edwards. And I'm curious, did you have any any struggle with kind of addending his criminal history in like a note to the person? 
No, I mean, I mean, so so both of those things probably fall into the same category for mm -hmm. us is that they're out of, out of the purview yes. of the film. Yeah. You know, so we weren't covering Southern in 1953. We weren't able okay. to do that. The film kind of jumps from uh, Brown versus Board of Ed um, to the sit-ins section that a lot of people saw yesterday to this section. So some things we just had to jump over. You know, we cover. I think 170 years of history in 82 minutes. So a few things we left out. Um, the same with with, with with the governor. And and, and you know sometimes when, when we show the film, you hear people snicker who know who he is. You know, I know some of his history. Um, but you know, it, it didn't it, it didn't seem like that. You know, uh, there was a place for that with, with, with it within this film. And we also you know, and we want you to stay in here. You know, you know, we're in 1971. We want you to stay there. We don't want you to flash forward and think about this guy's wives or wives or prison sentence or whatever, all that other stuff that's happened to the guy. You know, we want you to stay here um, and, and, and talk about saying who he is or anything like that would have, I think, pulled you out of the film or out of this time into some other headspace. Was that interview recently? The color was, the color interview was, yeah, like a, a little over a year ago. Yeah. A little uh, I have a question. There are two favorite moments within your films that I want to know something about the interview process. And one of them is in The Murder of Emmett Till. I believe he's the son of the, the sheriff, Roy Stryker. And he's wearing his U.S. Navy cap. He's sitting up by the banks of where Emmett Till's body's found. And he's saying, <laughs> they thought they could just come on down here and run the whole thing, criticizing, in retrospect, years later, the NAACP. Let me, let, me, let, let me answer that one first. Okay. That's kind of an uh, interesting story. So, so, so we were shooting the Eminem murder until we were down in the Delta, and you know, we actually hired a guy down there who was kind of a good old boy. Um, we hired him to kind of find some people. We really wanted him to find Carolyn Bryant, the woman who, who said he, he whistled at her. We really wanted her, him to find her. He, yeah, I think he actually found her, but she wouldn't do it. But he said, you know, um, I got, I got uh, Bryant. What's, what's the guy's name? Roy Stryker. Roy Stryker. I got Stryker. You know, let's go. I, I, I got him. I know, where, I know where he lives. So let's go over to his house. So we go over to Stryker's house, and Stryker's not there. And and we see in his and and, and we knock on his door. He's not there. And we see in the barn, the door is open, and there are these Trent Lot. Is it Trent Lot? Like signs, you know, a real like Trent Lot, like sitting there you know, and and the propping up the door. And we see a shadow. It's like somebody's in the barn. And so we go and I say, and, and I go there and I say, uh, you know, are you strike? He's like, yeah. What do you want? I said, we did the same thing. We said, we just want to talk to you, Mary. And he goes, well, I don't know if I want to talk to y'all about it. I said, come on, man. You just, you know, can we just talk for a minute? And he said, I don't know. I said, well, let's walk over there by the water. He lived, he lived right across the street from the river. And I said, well, let's just go over over here and by the river and talk. And went to the camera and said, well, <laughs> and we go over there, and and Stryker's standing there by the river, and I say, "You found you found him because somebody tell me about that." And, I, and he said, "Well, I, blah 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 blah. I saw this thing in the water, and I put it, and I pulled him up, and then I forgot." You, you, you said what the other thing is. Literally, every moment that that he gave us is what's in the film. And then he said, "I don't want to do this no more. I'm tired. I'm not gonna do this." And I said, "Okay, fine. Would you sign a release?" No. Yeah. <laughs> like bye. <laughs> I mean, literally every moment that we film with him is in the Another favorite moment, and really the question was, I, I would imagine that would be a white interview. The, 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 the person interviewing strike. That was me. Yeah. That was well, me as my wife. That was me as a white man. I got those powers, man. <laughs> Turn white. My, Mrs. Brief, my other favorite moment, and I suspect it was you, but I, I'm i very fond, uh, and I don't remember his name, but he was one of the L.A. Panthers. This is in the Black Panther, where he's talking about the standoff with the police, and he's saying, we felt free. And he goes on about it. It is so moving yeah. to actually hear that. Yeah, you know, because it's always detached history. Right. And to get right to it, it was like he was reliving it, and right. it was very. No, hard. that's that's a, that's an amazing moment. Yeah. So, so for those who haven't seen Panthers, there's a, a scene where the L.A. the Panthers are in a shootout with the L.A. police, and they're trapped in the in the buildings, and the 
police. It's the it's the SWAT team's first action. The LA SWAT team is the first SWAT team in the world. It's the first time they've ever done a no knock warrant, which means basically you just go and break down the door and start shooting. They've never done it before. It's the first time they've ever done it. They trap the Panthers in there, but the Panthers have like sandbagged all the windows and sandbagged the doors so so they can't. They can't shoot through and they have shooting ports, so it becomes this huge gun battle that goes on for eight hours with the, with the police. And the Panthers are trapped and they, they now are like running, they, they run out, basically run out of bullets. One guy says, oh, well, we, we kept enough bullets so that we could protect ourselves when the police came in. That's all we had left. We couldn't, they have no more bullets. And I asked them, I, my question to this guy, and it is the best moment in the film, one of the best moments I've ever had in my life. I asked him, you know what, my question to him was like, how did you feel? And he said, I felt free. I felt free. I was I was a free Negro. I was making my own rules. They couldn't get in, you couldn't get out. I was I might have been trapped there, but I was the king of that space. I felt free. It's like it's a startling moment, it's an incredible moment. And I think, and I, and I use this as an example of why I think that it's really important that people make their own films in within their own culture. He said that to me because I'm a black man and I understood what he meant. I know that's why he said that to me, all right? If he had said that to you, he would have said, I felt free after 150 years of uh, persecution and not being able to, you know, he would have had to explain it. But he knew I knew just what he meant when he said I felt free. And everybody in my office knew what he meant when he said that. And that, 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 that sequence fortified us in making the Panther film. You know, we would we would watch that over and over again. You know, when we felt bad, we'd be like, okay, well, at least we got this. At least we have this moment. And, and you know, film isn't made up of too many moments. You know, you got you know ten moments in an hour and a half. You got a film, and that was just an incredible, incredible moment. Well, please join me in saying thank you. I just want to say one last, one last thing is, you know, I just want to, I don't want to take any of this very lightly. I've been incredibly, incredibly lucky and fortunate to be able to tell these stories and, and to tell this history. It's been just like unbelievable for me. And so I just want to make sure that, that that's understood, you know, for, for, for all, all of you who work in history. I've just been like really fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll have, uh, more more clips and more conversation this evening at 7.30 at the T. Washington Auditorium, so please come. 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock, I'm sorry. 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Uh, there'll be free parking uh, there, so, and that's an important consideration down on Street. So thank you very much. All right, thank you.